us pray. Lord, thank you for the opportunity to hear your word and to even unpack it. May it be life to us. May you exchange my weakness for your strength, that you may be glorified. Amen. The story so far is that Naomi has returned home a widow, and she's also grieving the loss of her two sons. She has brought with her a daughter-in-law, Ruth, who has vowed that she will love and support Naomi right to the very end. She will never leave her. She will accept her people as her own people and her God as her own God. In order to support the two of them, she goes out to a field to glean the leftovers. And she just happens to have ended up in the field that belongs to Boaz, a good man. A man that takes a shine to Ruth. And he is so taken by all the, her kindness to her mother-in-law and all that he's heard about her, that he offers her protection. He offers her enough food that she has enough to take home to her mother-in-law and she offers her, he offers her the companionship of the other women. At the end of the day, Ruth goes home and tells Naomi all that has happened. And she says that it is Boaz's field. And Naomi's eyes sparkle. She says, he's a kinsman of ours. And the plans start. And she says to Ruth, daughter-in-law, I think it's time for me to find a home for you, to find security for you. Where you will be well provided for is not Boaz, a kinsman of ours. There is here very much an awareness that Naomi is concerned for Ruth's welfare. And she knows that marriage is the only way that Ruth is really going to be safe and secure for her future. So Naomi takes on parental responsibilities. She's going to try to find Ruth a husband. And so she reminds Ruth that Boaz is a kinsman. Now that's a very important word in this story. We have to understand it to understand all that is now going to happen. The kinsman has four very specific roles. Two of those roles are part of our story. In Leviticus, we are told that the kinsman redeemer is responsible for buying back or redeeming family land that for one reason or another has been forfeited. In, Deut in Deuteronomy, we're told that he's also responsible for carrying on the family name by marrying a childless willow. He marries a widow. It's usually a brother of the husband who has died. Marries the widow, and if there is a son born, that son is considered to really be the son of the dead man and bears his name and gains all the inheritance and rights of that son. And so this is what we're going to see as our story progresses. As a kinsman, Boaz has a legal right to be Naomi's girl or kinsman, but he's not obligated to do so. We know, as does Naomi has stated, that she's too old to bear children, and so she really isn't in the running to be a wife to be redeemed. But Ruth is. And Naomi decides that she will try to arrange circumstances so that Boaz will agree to be Ruth's, Ruth's kinsman redeemer by marrying her. So Naomi tells Ruth to wash and perfume yourself 
and put on your best clothes. Then go to the threshing floor, watch and see and wait until Boaz has finished his meal, see where he's lying down, and then go and uncover his feet and lie down. Well, there's lots going on here. Naomi is telling Ruth that it is now time for Ruth to take off her widow's wear, that she is to prepare herself and dress up make herself look really attractive. By telling Ruth to uncover Boaz's feet, Naomi is instructing Ruth to make it clear to Boaz that she wants him to marry her. Now, there's all kinds of things that commentators say. They say that this is an invitation for sexual intimacy, and perhaps it is. There is a sense that there is, would be nothing wrong with that because such a, an act at that time would really be considered a marriage from the kinsman as he redeems this woman. But we know too much about Boaz. We know too much about Ruth. That the, op the chances are that's not going to happen. These are honorable people, and they don't... Boaz shows that he doesn't want anything to harm Ruth's reputation. In Kings, we're told of something similar, and there it is a, a sign of supplication to just fall down to the feet and to say, I submit to you that I honor you and I am waiting for your help. I need your help. And I think that's what Ruth's doing. She's showing Boaz that she needs him to take on this responsibility. When Boaz wakes up, he's really startled to see Ruth at his feet, and he asks, who are you? And she replies, I am your servant, Ruth. Spread the corner of your garment over me, since you are a kinsman redeemer. When Ruth asks Boaz to spread his garment over her, she really is asking him to commit himself to her. If we look into scripture to see what this means, we can go to Ezekiel. God proclaims his love and commitment to his people when he says, Later I passed by, and when I looked at you and saw that you were old enough for love, I spread the corner of my garment over you and covered your nakedness. I gave you my solemn oath and entered into a covenant with you, declares the Sovereign Lord, and you became mine. While this is certainly a bold move on Ruth's part, her request for marriage is entirely appropriate because Ruth believes, along with Naomi, that Boaz is indeed her next of kin. And he, she wants him to claim her, to commit himself to her, as God has done in the past to his people. And Boaz is absolutely delighted to do this. He is delighted that she has chosen him rather than some of the younger men that she has obviously encountered over these weeks. And he says, the Lord bless you, my daughter. This kindness is greater than that which you showed earlier. You have not run after younger men, whether rich or poor. And now, my daughter, don't be afraid I will do for you all you ask. Although it is true that I am near of kin, there is a kinsman redeemer nearer than I. Yes, well, Boaz is flattered, and although he's surprised she hasn't sought after someone younger, he in no way regards her request as immoral or impertinent. He recognizes that she is honoring a family obligation. But he points out something that's very unexpected, and it's a huge problem. There is someone else who is closer in relationship, a closer kinsman redeemer than he is. So Boaz cannot exercise his right as kinsman redeemer unless this closer relative 
relinquishes his rights towards Ruth. But Boaz has a plan. He goes to the town gate and he sits there. And when the kinsman redeemer passes by, Boaz says, come over here, my friend, and sit down. Well, the town gate is the place where friends meet, where there's the administration of justice, where there are business transactions. It's the very center of life in any city, in any village. And Boaz has business to transact. The near kinsman of whom Boaz has spoken happens by, and he sits down. He doesn't quite know what to expect, but there he is. Boaz is really wise. He's a wily businessman. He invites 10 men to be witnesses. He doesn't want there to be any misunderstanding when all of this is over. And so Boaz says to his kinsman, Naomi, who has come back from Moab, is selling the piece of land that belonged to our brother Elimelech. Now this is the first that we've heard of this land. It's never been mentioned before. So we have to ask the question, where does this land come from? Was it a gift from Elimelech to Naomi? If so, why hadn't there been any kind of livelihood for Naomi when she returned? Why isn't she getting any of the benefits of this land? Has this land in her absence been forfeited? It happens. But as a widow, Naomi has no rights. She has no rights to inheritance. In the law of Moses, there is a very strict rule that even a daughter can inherit land, but a widow cannot. She is simply left out of everything. And so even if this land is rightfully hers, she has no inheritance right. But perhaps she's simply been unaware of it. We really don't know. Whatever, we, whatever the reason, what we do know is that she now seems to have a legal right for it to be reclaimed and to be sold. And it seems to be undisputed. So Boaz offers this nearest kinsman, which has sometimes been named Mr. No Name, he offers Mr. No Name the opportunity to buy this land. If you will redeem it, do so, says Boaz. But if you will not, tell me, so I will know, for no one has the right to it except you, and I am next in line. The first refusal belongs to Mr. No Name as the nearest kinsman. As an astute negotiator, Boaz states simply that Naomi is selling property belonging to their relative Elimelech. Does he want to buy it? The kinsman, thinking this property would be his and for his heirs, agrees to redeem the land. Then Boaz drops his bomb. He says, on the day you buy the land from Naomi and from Ruth the Moabites, you acquire the dead man's widow in order to maintain the name of the dead man with his property. It was a package deal, says Boaz. Mr. No Name could not accept one without the other. At this, the kinsman redeemer says, then I cannot redeem it because I might endanger my own estate. You redeem it yourself. Had he just been required to redeem the land, he would have been financially poorer, but the land would have been his. But if he were to marry Ruth and she bore him a son, the property would revert to the son and the kinsman would lose both the property and the money that he spent to buy it. His own estate would be diminished. So to act as the kinsman redeemer would have been a costly endeavor. And it's a cost this man is not willing to make. It's a cost, however, that Boaz is more than willing to pay out. So Boaz takes Ruth to be his wife. The nearest kinsman is, disappears out of the scene and Boaz, even though he's under no obligation to marry Ruth, he does so. He's, no, he's willing, motivated by love, not by self-interest. 
and how this is the st where the story gets a bit fuzzy and a little bit, perhaps a little bit fairy taleish if you don't consider it carefully. Ruth seems to slowly fade from the scene and Naomi takes front stage again. The women of the town gather around Naomi and they say, praise be to the Lord. They pray a blessing on Naomi rather than Ruth. And first of all, we can see that this whole, this whole story throbs with a life of prayer. There's prayer in adversity and sorrow. There's prayer in disappointment in daily work, in joy and celebration. There is always the undergirding of prayer. And so this is again a prayer of blessing and celebration for Naomi. This woman who returned home bitter, and as she says, empty, is now filled with hope. And she holds in her arms new life. For both Ruth and Naomi, there is a future and a hope. This baby is named Obed, and we're told that he was the father of Jesse, the father of David. Can you see that Naomi and Ruth and Boaz were a part of a plan and a purpose that was bigger than they could ever have imagined? God's fingerprints are all over their lives and they didn't know it. They gave God praise, they questioned God, especially Naomi, and yet God's fingerprints are on their lives. They were totally unaware of God's plan to use them for his purpose. And we see that it's in the ordinariness of the events of lives of ordinary people that God is working his purpose. Future significant lives were bound up with the history of Ruth. King David, how could anyone who would have expected at this story as Naomi returns so empty that she would become the great-great-grandmother of the greatest king of Israel and also one of the forebears of Jesus? And so there's this beginning of the story where everything is lost. There's death, there's sorrow. There's Naomi in the Valley of Tears. There's struggle, there's poverty, there's hopelessness. And then there comes this time when there's, there's this lovely ending. And we have to say to ourselves, is that true to what our experience is? We have to remember that no matter what has happened to Naomi, she has still lost her husband. She still bears the sorrow of a mother who has lost two sons. And that sorrow will never really go away. She has a, a grandson that she couldn't have imagined happening after all that had been before. But her sorrow is still a part of her life. We can see that Ruth is starting a new family, but she's not really starting a family. What she's doing is rescuing a family. We're seeing God's hand. We're seeing that these people matter to God. You and I have all had our tragedies. God's fingerprint is on our lives, and sometimes we don't even know it. There's sorrow in loss, all kinds of loss, and brokenness, and questions. And Naomi is a bit like Job, who has those questions, and there never really comes an answer. And yet God himself is always the one who shows himself to be sufficient. There's a lovely little book that's Pat Wood lent me that's called The Gospel of Ruth. And she looks at Naomi and Ruth from a, from a woman's point of view. But then she asks questions that 
about the mystery of God, how in our own lives we can all suffer these sorrowful things, and life doesn't end up with a baby in our arms and a, a husband that loves us and a home and property. It doesn't always end up that way. Sometimes we feel empty and alone and abandoned. And this is what she says. There is a mystery to God's ways, and we will never know why he doesn't answer our prayers, stop the blizzards, change the hardened heart, or stop the endless suffering in this world. But from time to time, we do have flashes of clarity, and we have a bit of clarity in Naomi's story. Naomi would be poorly equipped to do the job of raising the king's grandfather with an untested faith and a shallow knowledge of God that was derived from hearing the scriptures read in corporate worship and picking up second-hand information about him from other believers. She can't coast on Elimelech's theology either or the teachings of her parents. Vital as all these other resources and influences are, Naomi's participation in kingdom building is seriously impaired if she doesn't know God for herself. She has to experience him, not just learn about him. That means walking with him through storms, adversities, disappointments, and losses. For, no, for Naomi, it involves spending time at ground zero, getting angry, feeling betrayed, abandoned, and forgotten. She had to ask the hard questions, cope with unanswered prayers, and endure countless sleepless nights filled with doubts, fears, and anxieties. She had to find God's hesed, his steadfast love, in the middle of the mess. The dark night of the soul is an awful place to be, but that's where God trains his best warriors. It is in the dark night of the soul, in the valley of tears, that often we find our strength, and we come to know that Jesus is real. But our prayers aren't necessarily answered and the emptiness isn't filled until we know that it is Jesus that fills the empty spaces. And so it isn't really a Cinderella story. It's a story that says people matter, ordinary people matter, that God's in the pain and his fingerprints are there, even when we don't feel them, and that in the end God gives a future and a hope, but we don't even, don't always know what that future is. We don't always know the end of re result. And so I want to end with a prayer that, in the commentary, David Atkinson prays, and I think it's rather lovely. Let us pray. Almighty God, in Jesus Christ, our kinsman redeemer, you meet us in our ordinariness and make our human life your own. We thank you for your costly self-giving in redeeming love, setting us free to share the life of your family. You have taken our pains, our sin, our bitterness, our fear to yourself. Forgive us our sins and teach us how to forgive. Grant that, that, grant that when, like Naomi, we walk the valley of tears in the evening and in the dark, we may not lose sight of the resurrection dawn of hope and joy. Amen.